If you were to hear the term redneck nowadays, you would probably associate it with this. However, in early 20th century America, the term redneck held a vastly different meaning. It symbolized a forgotten chapter in American labor history that culminated in the government invading and bombing its own citizens in 1921. These are the coal mines of West Virginia, located in the northeast of the United States in an area commonly known as Appalachia. By the end of the 19th century, these territories were the engine driving the industrial growth of the United States. The workers in this isolated region lived in company towns, created and operated by coal companies. Life in this region was, for lack of a better word, atrocious. Men and children would spend 10 to 12 hours a day inside of a mine, all to receive an unjust and insufficient wage to spend in the overpriced mine-owned stores in the company towns. These horrid working conditions, coupled with the highest death rates for any job in America, forced these coal miners to find a solution. When this woman, Mary Harris, Mother Jones, showed up in 1901, representing the United Mine Workers of America, coal miners had hope for a better future through unionization. It's important to mention the diverse groups that made up these unions. By the start of the 20th century, a total of 20,797 miners worked in the recently opened West Virginia coalfields. These included 13,209 whites, 4,620 blacks, and 2,968 immigrants from British, Hungarian, German, Irish, Italian, Polish, and Russian descent. As explained by historian Ronald D. Eller, West Virginia coal companies actively recruited black and other minority laborers from Virginia and the Carolinas not only due to the shortage of local white miners, but this tactic aimed to hinder unionization by segregating the workers and playing one group against another. By having the miners fight and blame each other, they would never unite allowing the coal companies to just stand aside, clean up the mess, and pocket the profits. But that didn't go to plan. Several strikes witnessed the workers, previously segregated within company towns, uniting and initiating a joint strike in 1902. In response to this strike, mine operators hired private guards to keep union organizers out and to evict striking miners from their company homes. These evicted workers put up tent colonies, which, to the horror of coal companies, were not segregated as workers of different ethnicities and cultures united in the name of better working conditions for all. In 1912, the laborers of West Virginia's coal fields initiated a strike due to the continued challenging working conditions. Around 35,000 workers demanded various rights, including union recognition, freedom of speech and assembly, an end to blacklisting of union members, and fair pay to counteract the practices of cribbing, which involved modifying minecarts to include a little bit more coal, which underpaid miners for their coal extraction. The rejection of these demands and the employment of even more mine guards to suppress the strike only helped to escalate the conflict, resulting in violent clashes and a year of on and off fighting which eventually culminated in the declaration of martial law to suppress the unrest. This event is now known as the first of the West Virginia Cold Wars, but as the word first implies, things were about to get much, much worse. As shown by this graph, the strike successfully increased wages, but by 1920, these workers still faced harsh conditions, low wages, and excessive control by their companies. After the eviction of some workers in May 1920, several guards and workers were killed in an event known as the Matawan Massacre initiating the second and bloodiest Cold War in West Virginia. The famous 1921 Battle of Blur Mountain saw an estimated 15 to 20,000 miners engaged in a week-long labor war against an entrenched force of around 2,000 sheriff deputies and company guards. As the conflict developed, these violent clashes escalated to a point where President Warren G. Hardin threatened to send federal troops and some bombers. Army bombers were allegedly not used but other commercial airplanes were deployed that did drop homemade bombs and poison gas on the workers. Just a quick note. I want to explain the use of the word allegedly in this sentence, and overall I just want to add some context to the title of the video. The academic sources I used didn't go much into detail or didn't mention at all the use of bombers. Uh, I don't know why. This website and the Wikipedia page do say that it was army planes, but most importantly, this primary source, the cover of the Washington Times, explained that the U.S. Air Fleet was sent, led by Billy Mitchell, who we will talk more about in the upcoming strategic bombardment video. Yet this was written before the bombings, and it therefore cannot be 100% confirmed. Doing a little bit more digging, I did find this article written in 2022, which explains how historians believe that one of the planes might have crashed around the area, 
and might still be there, but they are waiting for permission to go and retrieve it. So it is very, very possible that it was US military planes who did the bombings, but it's not, as I said, 100% confirmed yet. Anyway, so let's get on with the video. Also referred as the Redneck War, this uprising stands as the largest armed insurrection in American labor history. During these strikes, unions occasionally distributed red handkerchiefs to miners during strikes, which they sometimes tied around their necks or arms, allowing fellow union members from nearby mines to recognize each other during conflicts. Thousands of union miners in the Redneck Army wore blue bib overalls and red handkerchiefs as an unofficial uniform. The opposing side, on the other hand, distinguished themselves by wearing white handkerchiefs and armbands. Hence, the red bandana not only protected miners from cold dust when working, but signified above all collective identity and consciousness within these towns. By 1921, the ultimate strength of the American army proved too much for the miners, who were eventually defeated. The 1920s saw the United States government resort to bombing and invading its own citizens instead of improving working conditions and ending corporate control. We must then remember the significance of the now-changed redneck expression, which shouldn't only be used to identify this, but should instead be employed to remember the lost workers that were killed in the name of unionization and the rights of workers in the United States of America. I hope you guys learned something new from this video. If you have anything you want to add or discuss, make sure to leave a comment below. Also, I want to thank these books and works which helped with my research, but you guys have the full bibliography in the description if you want to check out the books yourselves. Thanks for watching and Happy New Year.